In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen, and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And from the netherworld, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. There's a lot here. What stands out to me most is the rich man's desire to save his family members. And Abraham corrects him saying, even if they saw miracles, they won't be converted. And many times we see in the gospel, people who are desiring a sign, desiring a miracle, and it still does not convert them to have a greater love for Jesus Christ. Abraham reminds me a lot of people who come and ask me for help because of their family members who aren't practicing the faith. And they say, what can I show them? What can I get them to read? What can I say to my husband that will make him X, Y, or Z, convert, pray, be a better father? And we have to remember that conversion is all God's grace. We do the best we can to invite them and to invite them regularly. We do the best we can to give them the right materials, but we must have grace in order for there to be salvation. We must have grace in order to be for there to be conversion, and this grace comes from prayer. There's no getting around this. We must pray. St. Alphonsus de Guari says that those who pray a lot receive a lot. Those who pray a little, receive a little. What is this a lot? Is this a lot of money? No, a lot of grace or else we'd all be praying a lot so we'd be rich. No, we want to be rich in grace. And so even when I go give talks, I ask people to pray for me. Pray for the youth, pray for your husband, pray for your children and persevere in this prayer. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but when it comes to things of the soul, grace is the currency with which they are purchased, which reminds me greatly of the saint whose feast day is October the 1st, the great Saint Therese of Lisieux. She's the patron saint of missions, of evangelizers. Why? How can she be if she never left the convent? Why? Because she was a devout and prayerful, prayerful soul who obtained so many graces for the salvation of souls. She was the fuel that was energizing the missionary activity outside of the church. Some people can only pray and that's all that you can do Pray, 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 pray. St. Therese of Lisieux just didn't pray. As you know, as many people know, she coined what we call the little way, which is very simple. It's sacrificing in the small things, doing the small things with extraordinary love. And this makes you holy. Love is that quantitative, powerful, qualitative aspect, not quantitative, qualitative aspect of what we're offering to the Lord that can change everything. Two people can have the same job. 
two, two people can, can be in charge of cleaning the cafeteria. One, people, one person can be extraordinarily holy. The other person might not be very holy. One is doing their job with great love. One is doing their job with resentment. This is the little way. And I have found that the best way to implement the little way in your life is to start with the absolute smallest things. When you brush your teeth, say, Lord, I am brushing my teeth for you. When you're drinking your water, just think of the Lord for half a second. I drink this water for you. It, it boils down to doing your state in life. If you're a father, if you're a mother, do those activities playing with your children. You get home from work, I know you're tired. I'm tired too. And saying, I don't want, I'm not gonna sit here and watch television. I'm not gonna sit here and look at my phone. I'm gonna go and I'm talk to my children. I'm gonna play with my children. And you might not want to, but that's the key. Love isn't about feelings. So I can say, Lord, I'm gonna sacrifice this of myself to be with my kids, to be with my family. And that is what's gonna make you holy. Holiness does not consist in extraordinary activities. It, it consists in ordinary activities done with extraordinary love. So St. Therese was so powerful and people will ask me, they'll say, tell me, what did St. Therese do? What did she do? She did nothing. That's why I think that God raised her up because she was so humble. He raised her and exalted her above many of the other saints. She's more popular than many other saints. She's got one of the largest basilicas dedicated to her, and it's because she was so humble, and God wanted to give us an example of holiness in the ordinary activities of our life. But again, practice to practice this, it starts very small, number one. Do it in the small things. It sounds very easy, but we quickly forget. It takes a lot of practice so that it comes naturally. But make this your goal for an entire week. You have to start with a goal and then you can work towards it. Second, think of your state in life. In any activity that you do, like let's say you go to work, you go to work, you try to please your boss. Okay, the same activity, change who you're trying to please through your work. Instead of trying to please your boss, you say, Lord, I'm gonna fill out this document. I'm gonna speak to this person out of love for you and you do the best you can again it's not going to be a little feeling it's an act of the will conforming your will to the will of god sacrifice after all we also we say sacrifice is love well sacrifice your will for god's and that is how you express your love for him and thirdly concerning the little way prayer 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 is absolutely critically important. I don't care what state of life you are. Sometimes I will meet mothers, and I'm gonna use mothers as an example because this, they have busy lives, they're carrying babies, and it can be very difficult to find time to pray. And so naturally, the recommendation that they receive and that we give and that I give is the little way. When you're changing that baby's diaper, do it with as much love as possible. When you hear the baby crying, say, yes, Jesus, here I come. I know it's difficult, but in order to do this well, you must, you must, you must make time to pray, private time to pray, and then it makes doing these little activities much easier. Speaking of parenting, one of the greatest lessons that we can find, in addition to the little way from the life of St. Therese, is that she wasn't alone. She had very many holy sisters, and I'm not talking about religious sisters. She had holy biological sisters. Where did she get these holy biological sisters? From holy biological parents. The parents of St. Therese, St. Louis and St. Zelie are canonized saints. And they're saints because they lived their vocation properly to the best of their ability. They recognized in their matrimony their call to sanctify the spouse and sanctify the children. And this does not come naturally. It's not just going to happen on accident. You have to make a firm act of the will to stand firm in this resolution. Again, this is going to come through deep prayer to find the willpower, to have the insight and the inspiration on what to do. But I would say that St. Louis and St. Zelie did this one thing above all else, and that's called deliberate parenting. They started with the end in mind. All throughout their writings, you can see that their life was focused on the Lord their God, and they saw the end that they wanted. They wanted their children to become saints. They wanted their children to become holy. They wanted their children to be united with them in heaven. And so they started with that end in mind, and then they took concrete actions to make that happen. 
They did, they did not leave the education of their children up to the state or the school or the television or some other teachers. They were the primary educators. If you look at the life of St. Therese, you will see that their family took their faith number one in the education of their faith. Number one, they would pass around the book, The Imitation of Christ. There's so many great lessons, but how can we be deliberate in our parenting today? We need to look at our goal for our children is heaven. What are the things that are going to get in the way of achieving that goal? That means we need to monitor the me their media consumption. That means we need to anticipate the things that they are going to encounter. And we need to strongly form them in two ways. They have an intellectual formation. We know that the world is atheistic. We know that the world is run by the prince of this world, which is the devil, and he is going to get his hands in anywhere he can. That means in childhood cartoons, that means in public schooling, even in Catholic schooling, he's going to find a way to put his hands in there. And the devil is the father of lies, so we must equip our children with intellectual truths. We know that the world is atheistic, so we need to give them intellectual truths on proofs proofs of the existence of God, that our, our religion isn't just a fairy tale, that being Catholic is about faith and reason. We have faith and we have reason that supports that and the two are not contradictory. So that when they are attacked and they will be attacked, they have something strong and they can give an account of what they believe in with love. And you need to be the one to educate them. Educate them on the truths of sexuality. Educate them on the truths of the history of the Catholic Church. Educate them on the truths of apologetics and it's difficult, but you need to make time to have those difficult conversations to prepare them. It's our, it's our responsibility as parents to do this. So we have an intellectual formation, and then we have a spiritual formation that is also very important. That means praying with them, setting a good and holy example, teaching them their prayers, but that is not enough. They need their own personal, private prayer life that they can develop. At the age of reason, there's no reason at the age of seven why they cannot make visits to the Blessed Sacrament. 10 or 20 minutes in silence. And yes, it might be difficult to get them to do that at first. So you need to be persuasive. You need to say, well, I, if you go with me to the chapel or after the chapel, you can say, after the chapel, hey, let's go get an ice cream. You did so good in there. I'm so proud of you. And then the, once they realize how much better they feel after visiting the Blessed Sacrament, spending time in silence, they will develop their own prayer life. You have to be as delicate and as gentle as a dove, but as cunning as a serpent. This quiet time that they spend in prayer with God is really going to form the foundation of their life. They need this time, especially before the Blessed Sacrament. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. If you don't believe that children are not possible of extraordinary holiness, look at the lives of Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia of Fatima. Again, all of this, the foundation of all things is prayer. Prayer is the life of the soul. Prayer is the life of the family. Prayer will give you confidence, which is my third lesson from the life of St. Therese. St. Therese was all about being confident and trusting in God and in God's providence. One of my favorite quotes from St. Therese uh, is mentioned in the book Abandonment to Divine Providence by Kassad. And she says, if I did anything other than this, I would have no peace. What was she talking about? She leaves her past to God's mercy. Whatever you've done, whatever you've been through, whatever failures you have in your life, it's done. It does not exist. It only exists in your mind. Leave it to God's mercy, repent of it, and let it go. It doesn't exist anymore. The future, it doesn't exist yet. She would say, leave it to God, leave the past to God's mercy, and I entrust the future to God's providence. God's providence will provide all things. This is an act of faith. Not to worry is an act of faith. Trust that God will provide. Trust in God's word. In the garden, the serpent tempted Eve and got her to distrust God's word. So we are gonna experience that same temptation to distrust that God will provide for us in the moment, in the future. She says, I leave my past to God's mercy. I leave my future to God's providence and I do everything possible to focus on my duties of the present moment. And, and she said, if I didn't do this, I would never have peace. We have to do everything we can with great love in the present moment. And you'll know you're, God, you'll know you're doing God's will because you'll pause and you'll say, Lord, what should I be doing right now? And he'll say, changing this diaper. He'll say, you know, mowing the lawn, talking to your kids about tough topics and giving them good arguments. All of these things should inspire great confidence in us. 
God bless you. God love you. And I hope to see you next week.